Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, rabbis and rabbitsons, distinguished people from all over, and of course, our honored and special guest, Dr. Elie Wiesel. I welcome you to the second annual Gershon Jacobson Memorial Lecture in honor of my dear father, Gershon. So I speak here on behalf of my entire beautiful family, my mother, Sylvia, and my siblings, Freyde, Baruch Sholem, Chani, and Yosef Yitzchak. Achren and Achren Chovig, Yosef Yitzchak, the editor of the Algemeine Journal, who took over and is doing, some say, even though this may be blasphemous, a little better job even than my father himself. <laughs> the Rosh Hashiva Aponovich, who was known for his wit and wisdom, once said, he said it in Yiddish, I will say it in Yiddish as well. He spoke at a dinner. And he was the last speaker. And he got up and he said, he said that till now all the speakers spoke about Torah, but the kavana, the intention was really money, raising money for the institution. I, I will speak to you about money, but my intention is really Torah. <laughs> so there are many people, less than it used to be, that speak Yiddish. But many speak Yiddish. And the message is an English message, a secular message. So if I have that read in English, but my kavone is Yiddish. I will speak to you in English, being that it's the language of our nation. For good or for bad, this is our language. But my neshama, and the intention of this evening, and its eternal meaning, is the Yiddish spirit. Yiddish neshama which is so captured in the words of Yiddish, but when you work hard enough, you can also convey it in other languages. So let me begin with a story about a story, the power of a story. They say in the time of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, that the Baal Shem Tov had a great custom, right before Rosh Hashanah every year, He would go to a particular area that only he knew, would light a little fire in a special way, and would say a prayer in the Baal thought. And he was praying and asking for a blessed year for the entire Jewish people, for the entire world. In the next generation, his student, the Magad of Mizritch, because we call Yuridus Hadaris, things get diluted, sometimes things are lost, some of the secrets of the past. So he too would go to the same place, but he didn't know how to light the fire. So he would go to this place, say the prayer, and bless him for, and for, a, for a blessed new year. And the next generation, the Magad had many students. And they too inherited this custom. So they would also go to the location. But they didn't know the prayer, nor did they know how to light the fire. So they would just stand there. And we, generations afterwards, we don't know how to light the fire. We don't know the tefillahs, the prayers. We don't even know the location. What do we do? We tell the story. And being that that's our, in our power, and we don't have more power than that, by telling the story in our own humble way, standing on the shoulders of giants before us, we can achieve sometimes 
the same that our parents and grandparents achieved through their powerful revelations. This, in essence, my friends, is the mission that we established after my father Geshen Jacobson passed away, the Geshen Jacobson Jewish Continuity Foundation. Simply put, my father's own words, is to tell the Jewish story. And this isn't a small matter, because the Jewish story is a complicated one. It spans through thousands of years of history, and spans not through, only through good times, through many difficult times. Times when you don't want to speak. Times of anguish. And through all the ups and downs, the well, one thing our parents and ancestors were committed to was mitzvah l'sapir, the yigadah tol v'imcha. In different ways, they told the story. They made sure that the chain would not be broken, the mesorah and the chain would not be broken. In many ways, that's what kept the people together. It was never broken. Among the great storytellers of our time was my father. The word sipur in Hebrew has more than just story. It means sphere to count. It means sapphire, like an, a sapphire stone. It illuminates. The Kabbalists will tell you that it refers to the cosmic forces at work. The Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, begins that with three sforim, with three books that God created the universe. The Sefer, the Sefer, with a vav and the sipur, with a book, with a scribe, and with a story. So our story is more than a story. It captures the tears and the twinkle of Jews throughout history. Maybe that's why Yeshai the Novi says, he speaks about the worries that a person has in a difficult times, and he says, Ayeh Sefer. Where is the Sefer? Ayeshekel. We're the people that measure. Because sometimes it's hard to find the people that speak. And we therefore established a foundation that is dedicated to continue telling the story with the passion, with the integrity, without compromising the spirit, but at the same time speaking to people of all backgrounds. And we do so and continue to grow, thank God, through the vehicle of the Algemeiner Journal which we intend to develop, to be able to reach far greater audiences than just Yiddish speaking, to the algemeiner.com, the website, which I invite you all to visit. Through this annual lecture, and through methods to digitalize and preserve the legacies in telling the story of the Jewish people in the last thousands of years, but specifically in our own time, I'm now going to introduce the lecturer of this year's lecture. But before I do so, I want to just tell you the order of things. We will hear from Dr. Wiesel, followed by a short video that tells the story. And I encourage you to stay for that video as well. Short. And then the program will be over. I invite you all to partner with us in this effort. And we intend to create other such beautiful evenings that celebrate Judaism in the, the greatest way possible, its majesty, as I said, for all people of all backgrounds. Dr. Wiesel and my father go back long before I remember. And though they come from different parts of the world, but their stories are very similar. Dr. Eli Wiesel was born in Siget city that was transferred from Romania, Hungary, pre-World War II, in a beautiful town, saturated with Yiddishkeit, with the spirit, with the Neshama. And then, at age 15, young age, tender age, torn away <coughs> with his family and with thousands, hundreds of thousands of others. My father was born similar time, in another city called Moscow. And there they had to contend with another monster. My father at age five had to witness his father being arrested by the 
NKVD, the so-called KGB of the time, sent off to Siberia. And both survived. Yibar Luchayim Luchayim. And they met, I don't know the first time they met, I'd have to check on that. But I know that they met in the halls of the UN. Interesting place. As journalists, storytellers, but in the full sense of the word. Dr. Wiesel, as many of you may know, for 10 years did not tell the story. It was quiet. Shtika. That itself is a story. But he was silent. But then, when time came, different ways God, mysterious ways, getting people to follow, reach their destiny, began to speak, to write. First book, The Delta of Yishvim, that the world was silent. And that was the story that had to be told. So as one of the Rebbe says, It's hard to speak, but it's also even harder to remain silent. And as such as, I don't want to use the word brilliant, but as such, in a faithful way, convey the story of the world that was before. And what happened in between, and the world of today. These are sacred words, sacred story, because it actually captures the story of everyone here in this room, of every Jew on this planet. So this concern that Yeshaya and Ovi had, a yes safer, where is there a safer? Where will we find a person who tells a story? So thank God we have, in our midst, a man like Dr. Wiesel. So I want you to all join me in welcoming him, honoring him, as he honors us, honors my father. Two men, as I said, who shared many similar destinies and maintained their commitment to the sanctity of the work and the blessings that God gave them. Again, Yabad Luchayim Luchayim. Dr. Wiesel should be blessed with many healthy years to continue the sacred work of being a witness, a witness that speaks and is silent. So I have the honor, the distinct honor, to welcome Dr. Eli Wiesel, who will speak to us, being that it's 40 years from the Six Day War, about remembering the Six Day War, another major story of our times. Dr. Wiesel. children are close to me because your husband and your father was close to me. A few words in Yiddish simply. Tzveyo, Ado, Shein Tzveyo, Bleis Tzveyo, Stuchtzich, Nechten, Dilabaya. There is not each mit uns. Two years have passed. Eternity, a short eternity. My late friend Gershon and I were close on many levels. Our relationship was based on trust and rooted in a profound, all-encompassing love for the people and state of Israel. When I worked for the Forward and he for the Morgan Journal at the United Nations, and elsewhere. We never saw one another as competitors, quite the opposite. We shared information and ideas. In my absence, I chose him to represent Yediot Achronot, for which I worked from Paris first and then in New York. When I decided to go to the Soviet Union in 1965, it was with him that I worked out my itinerary. It was he who arranged my first visit to the Yabavid Charebi, Zatzal. When he decided to create the Algemeine Journal, I was at his side. 
He believed in the importance to address Yiddish-speaking readers. He brought them joy at five steers. When the Jewish people was triumphant, he celebrated for them, with them. Whatever was Jewish ceased to be alien to him. He was always proud of his sons, so full of knowledge, devotion and talent. So are we. I miss Gershon, and naturally today's lecture is dedicated to his memory. Now, yes, we shall remember 40 years ago. Actually, it's exactly 40 years ago that the war, the Six Day War, ended. The Golan was conquered by Dado el Azar, and the State of Israel and people, Jewish people all over the world, were still in ecstasy. Because the central event was not the Golan, nor the Sinai Desert. The central event was Jerusalem. So therefore tonight, I shall speak about 40 years since the liberation of Jerusalem. Now, you, Rav Shimon, mentioned Yiddish, the importance of Yiddish, it's my, my attitude as well. I have written only one book in Yiddish, the first, as you mentioned, but I wrote many articles, including in your paper. Sometimes I say to myself that actually, I always, I publish 50 books about everything, about Hasidism, about Gemore, about the Bible, about philosophy, about mysticism. I have written many, many books in French, but, there is a but, I write in Yiddish, it's coming out in French. <laughs> the Nigun is there, Yossi knows that. The Nigun is there, the, 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 the space is there, the nostalgia is there. It's Yiddish, it comes out in French. The same thing was said, actually, was said by Mary Weisgau about Agnon, and he said it to Agnon. He actually unites in Yiddish, it's coming out in Hebrew. So there are so many Yiddish writers who write in other languages, but they write in Yiddish. Now, 40 years, it's a biblical generation. A generation has passed. But then we live in biblical times. The Jews have learned that. We have learned because whatever we do always goes to the extreme. It's either very good or very bad, never boring. Whatever we undertake has biblical connotations. Again, 40 years ago, believe me, I was in Israel, I'll come to that. At that time, literally every person in Israel, adult and child, agnostic or, or, or fervently religious. They all believe that they were living in biblical times. The fact is that when the army uh, attacked in Sinai, at many points they used the Bible in order to conquer certain positions. The names were biblical names. All of them. It's not uh, Zephidim, it's a biblical name. It's not simply taken from modern history. It was taken from ancient history. And therefore, those events remain with me to this day. I was at the UN, and I remember that three weeks before the war began, I listened to all the speeches. And when we listened and we reported those speeches, fear has entered us. The Arabs, there was a man named Ahmed Shukeri, he was the first PLO president, the predecessor to Arafat. And he simply said, yes, there's going to be war, and we shall throw all the, the Israelis into the sea, and there will be no more problem. Many of the Arab speakers echoed his words. 
and there was no one except for one, Arthur Goldberg, Sifro Lodi Bracha. Arthur Goldberg was the American ambassador to the UN, and all his fervent Jewishness was invested in his attitude at the UN. Stories that cannot be told yet. Believe me, have to do diplomatically helping Israel attain its military victory. He is the only one who would speak up on behalf of Israel. All the others remain silent. And many of us, some of us still remember, more, many of you are young, were born afterwards. We had a feeling that this time Israel has to have may lose. That would be the end. We felt it so strongly that a man in France named Raymond Aron, he was a great philosopher, very great, assimilated Jew, that he too was worried, and he published in Le Figaro, an important daily, on the front page, his article saying, I do not want to survive Israel. So he became involved in Israel because of that. And I confess many of us felt like that. At that time I wasn't married yet and I knew that when the war begins I will go there thinking again. My Israeli friends laugh at me or are angry at me that I didn't have that much enough faith in the Israeli army. But I felt I was going to Israel and really stupidly because I couldn't help. I just be there when terrible things will happen. The first day was a Monday. The war is already on and Moshe Dayan was very clever and he ordained, he ordered a total blackout. On the Israeli side there was absolutely no news. All the news reports came from the Arabs. And they it's not by Chazek Hashem, it's by somewhere, it's in the Bible. Something happened to them. They were convinced that they were winning the war. They lost the war during the first three hours when the entire Air Force was destroyed. They lost the war, the war was finished. They were convinced that they won it. And the radio reports came in, I heard them saying, Beersheba is burning, Tel Aviv is burning. And then, next day, we heard the news about the great victory. I, of course, went to, this, to, to Israel. At that time, all the international airlines stopped. The only one was allowed from Paris, not from here. There was still a company called an airline company, TWA. I got the last seat on that company, went to Paris and took the plane. I was tired, didn't sleep all night. And here comes a funny story. There must be something funny too. Uh, I, said, I got the last seat, literally, the last seat on the plane next to the door, the back seat. The plane took off. The stewardess, very beautiful girl with dark hair, seductive. And she came up to me, she said, I know who you are. <laughs> and I said to myself, really, Gamma, I work all my life to know who I am, and she already knows who I am. <laughs> and she said, I, I read your book. And usually I would have said, which one? Because she meant it in singular. By then I published at least ten books. But she was so beautiful, I didn't say anything. And she would come again. She, I was treated, my God, with cognac. I don't drink, but she brought me. I had to drink. <laughs> and at one point, when others were already sleeping, she said to me, "You know, I know your book so, your, your book so well, but there's one chapter in, in it I don't understand, Mr. Schwarzbach." <laughs> I really became very, very modest. I said, lady, I am not Andre Schwarzla. She said, come on, I know you are incognito. Lady, I am not. She said, come on. And she went on treating me 
so beautifully. I felt guilty <laughs> that I'm actually uh, lying. I, I live a false life. So much so that I said to her, you know, young lady, I'll tell you why you mistake me for him. Number one, I'm also a writer. Number two, he wrote one book, I wrote a few, but one, at least one of them has the same subject. His book is called, by the way, a great, great novel, The Last of the Just. He died a few months ago. And third, he actually, you know, once it happened that either his picture was on my book or my picture was on his book. And therefore you, you make a mistake. And also we resemble one another. And she said, you know, Mr. Schwarzman, I thought I knew everything about you. What I didn't know is that you have a sense of humor. <laughs> so what could I do anymore? I, I kept quiet. <laughs> Twenty minutes before arrival in, in Lida. And to arrive, you know, I was, we all emotionally arrived in, in, in Israel in time of war, what of war. Then she came back to me. This time she was less beautiful because she was somehow arrogant. She said, I don't know who you are. I said, at last. <laughs> and she said, one thing I do know, you are not Andre Schwarzbach. <laughs> and I was stupid enough to say, prove it. <laughs> and she said, I'll prove it to you. He sits there. <laughs> and it's true, Andre and I were very good friends, very good friends. So, I jumped up, he jumped up, and we embraced. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, what are you doing here? We both came to bear witness. So we came there. I went quickly to Jerusalem. I arrived in Jerusalem one day after Jerusalem was liberated. And I will never forget that day. We had the feeling that the entire country stopped everything. The soldiers stopped fighting, although the war was still going on in the desert and later in the Gola. Everybody was running, running to Jerusalem. We had that feeling that history was running. Maybe Kavyoko himself was running to Jerusalem. We were running to Jerusalem. And I came to the wall. At that time, the wall was still in a small little street, not like today, a piazza. Era. And to see what was happening there is what feeds my imagination to this day. I would go every single day to the wall. And I began actually whispering, whispering a story that I was going to write. I would whisper it, I would write it with my lips and in the evening go to the hotel and write it down. What have we seen then? A miracle? Somebody said, of course it was a miracle, otherwise how could we have won? The miracle was more secret than they were. So, 40 years ago, we all felt, we felt that something happened that we don't understand, that whatever happened will affect our lives. I remember I went to see Tzhak Rabin. I used to see every day in the morning, I used to see Levi Eshko, the Prime Minister, whom I knew from before. I loved that man. He was so quiet sober, discreet, and uh, he suffered a lot because of politics. And he said to me, go and see Tzhak Rabin, who was the commander-in-chief of the army. I went to see him. The problem was he was very timid, so was I. He is so timid <coughs> that the story is that when he got married later, married with Leah, there were so many people there that he turned to Leah and he said, Leah, this is the last time I marry you. <laughs> and he was so timid that he didn't speak. So was I. So I didn't speak. So for many, many long minutes, we didn't speak. And that's how we became good friends. 
Later I asked him, tell me, what do you think is the effect of the war? And he said, quote, it will take 30 years, he said, for the Arabs to overcome their defeat. And it will take 30 years for us to overcome our victory. He was a great general, but a very poor prophet. Six years later, the Yom Kippur War. But until then, what do you know? We felt in the seventh heaven, all of us. People loved one another. All of a sudden there was no wall, no difference between religious and non-religious. All of a sudden, people were human because of that event. Warm, compassionate, loving. Forty years later, there are people already in Israel who say it was a mistake. There are. Some of them sit in parliament. And they say, we should have given up everything right away. The first to say that was Ben-Gurion himself, who was, not, who was out of power. <coughs> he came to the old city and he turned to the generals and he simply said, give everything back except Jerusalem. The philosopher Yeshayahu Lebovich said exactly the same thing, give everything back. Why? Simply because they said, this is the time. And in France, by the way, Mendes France, Pierre Mendes France, a former Prime Minister, a good Jew, he also believed that this is the time for Israel to give back all that it had taken, and therefore they will make peace with the Arabs. Peshkov was ready. Many people were ready. Except that the Arabs had a meeting in Khartoum. And instead of saying to the Israelis that were, there were already secret negotiations or at least contacts, instead of saying, okay, let's try and do something, they came out with a charter which was called the Three No's. No to Israel's existence, no to negotiation, no to, any, no to recognition of Israel. Nothing. But Israel had no choice. And they remain. Nevertheless, today people believe that whatever is happening today in Israel, and today there are things in Israel that happen, and I'm the, I'll be the last to say things here about, you know, corruption and, and scandals and so forth. I, I cannot speak about that because I, as a rule, have made almost a neighbor that I will never, never say anything bad about Israel outside of Israel. I will never criticize Israel. The man with my past, the man with my moral philosophy believe that I cannot, I must be always there to be with Israel in times of happiness, in times of sorrow. When Israel is dancing or when Israel is weeping, I, I will be there. But today there are people who say that maybe that was a mistake. They should, they should have given it back. And not only that, Give it back now. The things have changed. Whatever Israel will do, one thing is clear. The event that took place 40 years ago has still the lasting effect on the Jewish psyche in the world and on the soul and the spirit of the Israeli people in Israel itself. Again, the main thing was, of course, Jerusalem. Strangely enough, it happened as a mistake on the part of Jordan. Eshkol, the Prime Minister, sent three messengers to King Hussein. America tried to prevail upon Hussein. France tried to prevail upon Hussein not to enter the war. But Hussein entered the war. That was one of the greatest mistakes, from his viewpoint, in his life. Why? The Israeli Mossad occasionally broadcasts a tape, a co taped conversation between Nasser and Hussein. And Nasser says to Hussein, my brother Hussein, what are you waiting for? 
we won the war. Israel is already defeated. And if you don't enter the war now, then you will not take part in the victory. And the idiot, <laughs> believe me, the Nasser said that there was absolutely no way for the Arabs to win. But he didn't know it. Nasser didn't know it. He was misled by his own generals, who were afraid to tell him the truth. So Hussein believed it. Had Hussein not entered the war, Jerusalem would still, all Jerusalem would still be Jordan. The West Bank was still before. And then what? Would it be better? Whenever the discussions develop about the uh, other side, we must not forget, we must never forget. In Gaza there is a civil war now. Israel has nothing to do with that. Just like in Iraq, Israel has nothing to do with the war in Iraq, surely not. And nevertheless, those who are the enemies of Israel say again and again, falsely, arrogantly, that it's all Israel's fault. Israel was to give up the territories, the war in Iraq would stop, the war in Gaza would stop. Furthermore, what happened? Israel unilaterally withdrew from South Lebanon. Unilaterally. Came Hezbollah and established its bases to fire hundreds and thousands of rockets, missiles, in Israel. Israel evacuated Gaza unilaterally. What happened? Hamas established missile bases in Gaza. So Israel must ask itself the question of what are we to do? How far can we go? What else shall we give up? For what and for whom and with whom? The Palestinians democratically elected the government of Hamas. The charter of Hamas publicly, openly, clearly speaks of the destruction of Israel. So 40 years later Israel again is facing challenges and dangers. And what really can we do? I believe, again, whatever we do, we must do it for. For Israel. All that is because of Jerusalem. When I came there, I, among the very first pages I wrote about that, is this <coughs> Jerusalem, the face visible yet hidden, the sap and the blood of all that makes us live or renounce life, the spark flashing in the darkness, the murmur rustling through shouts of happiness and joy, a name, a secret, for the exile, the prayer, for all others that promised, Jerusalem. Seventeen times destroyed, yet never erased, the symbol of survival. Jerusalem, the city which miraculously transforms man into pilgrim, no one can enter it and go away un unchanged. Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlaw, the storyteller of Hasidism, liked to say that no matter where he walked, his steps turned to Jerusalem. As for me, I discovered it in the sacred world without taking a single step. I saw it then as I see it now. Here is the valley of Yoshafat, where one day the nations will be judged. The Mount of Olives, where one day death will be vanquished. The citadel, the fortress of David, with its small turrets and golden domes, where suns shatter and disappear. The gate of mercy heavily bolted that anyone other than the Messiah tried to pass and the earth will shake to its foundation. And higher than the surrounding mountains of Moab and Judea, here is Mount Moriah, which since the beginning of time had lured men in quest of faith and sacrifice. It was here that he first opened his eyes and saw the world that henceforth he would share with death. It was here 
that Matt, Matt and Barry Lonely, as he began speaking to his creator and then to himself, it was here that his two sons, our forefathers, discovered that which links innocence to murder and further to malediction. It was here that the first believer, Abraham, erected an altar on which to make an offering of both his past and his future. It was here, with the building of the temple, that man proved himself worthy of sanctifying space as God had sanctified time. The city of unshakable memory, I admit loving it. I even admit loving this hold over me. Distant lands no longer lure me. The seeker is weary of seeking, the explorer of self-excitement. Beneath this sky in which colors and faces clash, steps in the night reverberate to infinity. One listens spellbound, overwhelmed. Follow them far enough and will take by surprise a king lost in a dream, a prophet who reduces life and language to dust. Why then don't you follow them? You are afraid because you are who you are. This is how I wrote the whole book. Rabbi Nachman says somewhere he wanted to turn his prayers into stories. I wanted to turn my stories into prayers. And that was a prayer. And to this day, of all the books that I have written, there are certain pages here that I hope will remain, just as prayers remain, beyond the ages, crossing frontiers of time and human development. I have seen Jerusalem Saint Jane last three times. The first time was the darkest of all times. When, in 1944, the truth of my town, Siget, arrived where they arrived. And we didn't know anything where we were. We had never heard the name of the place. But all of a sudden I saw people gathering there. From all over the exile. Young and old. Learned and ignorant, workers, artists, all came, speaking all languages, representing all spheres of human activity. And they were there, walking. And in my childish mind, I come from such a religious Hasidic family, I believe in the coming of the Messiah. I, had, I, I wondered, maybe the Messiah has come. Maybe. And therefore, we all came to greet him. There, my God, there! The second time was in Russia. I said that before going there, I spoke a lot to Gershon about Russia because he was the best qualified person to talk to me about it. And I wrote later on my book, The Truth of Silence, in which I described not the silence of the Jews there, the silence of the Jews here, to their courage, to their obstinacy, to their loyalty to our people. And I described Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah in Moscow. When all of a sudden, thousands, tens of thousands of young boys and girls came from all over town to sing and dance. While inside they were dancing with the Torah, outside they were dancing, just dancing and singing Hebrew songs. And I had a feeling that too belongs to the Messianic period. There. But they had done. They rediscovered their roots, their memories. Although at that time, 1965, at that time, there were no Jewish schools there, very few synagogues. I used to meet them in cemeteries that I taught them, told them things that I knew about them about today, including Jewish songs, Jewish stories, in cemeteries. And at one point, I, had, I, didn't, I was, didn't speak Russian, I had a translator with me, and at one point we stopped at the group, and there was a group with a, again, a, a quiet conductor, a girl. And I was, I'm lucky at that time again, uh, yeah, very beautiful. And uh, she was saying something. Who are we in Russian? They said, Yevrei, true. What do we want to be? Yevrei, and so forth and so forth. Yevrei. Each time, Yevrei, Yevrei, Yevrei. 
and they were exuberant. And at one point, I asked her, tell me, I see you when you speak about Jews. Uh, are you Jewish? She said, yes. What do you know about Jews, about Judaism? She said, nothing. All I know is what I read in the newspapers. What do the newspapers say? That the Jewish people is imperialist, uh, hungry for power, false, all the anti-Semitic propaganda was there. Then why do you want to be Jewish, she said. Not what they say. I don't know. I left her. And then she ran after me. The only time in my life that a girl ran after me. Really. <laughs> and she pulled me by my sleeve and said, Sir, I don't know who you are, but you asked me a very good question. Why I want to be Jewish? I'll tell you why. Because I love to sing. At this point, I was ready to embrace her and kiss her. She said something so naive, so beautiful. A Jew is someone who sings. And, you know, we know what it means. The song, the song, the song, the language of the soul. You are happy, you sing. I'm happy, you also sing. If you want to sing, you sing. If you don't want to also sing. There is a song for everything. So I, I felt good. Years later, I was in Israel. And I would go when I was in Israel. At that time, the Aliyah from Russia was secret, clandestine. They would come to the airport, lead up special place, nobody could go there, and nobody had a very sick. I felt like an in-law there, you know, at a wedding. But I would come in the morning, 4 o'clock, and once I was there, when the plane arrived from Vienna, and I saw the Jews come down, all of the Jews fell and kissed the ground, and then I saw a beautiful girl. And of course, I recognized her. She didn't recognize me. I didn't make any impression on her, but she made an impression on me. So I came, I came and shook her hand. She thought I was a functionary of the Sakhmut, of Jewish agency. But I didn't let go. At which point, she identified me. And she said, am I going to sing now? Well, that Simcha Torah for me is also part. I had a feeling, in a way, that we used to say, Vilna Yerushalayim Velita, Jerusalem moves. I had the feeling, Yerushalayim the Moscow. Jerusalem was in Moscow. And of course, the third time was the one that I described to you. And therefore, when I think today of Geshem, I remember we spoke about it a lot, because we, I wrote about I wrote about that quite a lot, articles and articles in the forwards. And then in my book, I will read in conclusion for you just part of, an, of a prayer really, that I wrote there, standing in front of the Kotel on our thing. And it goes like this. I heard a voice inside me saying, I am the eye that looks at the eye that is looking. I shall look so hard that I shall be blinded. So what? I shall sing. I shall sing with such force that I shall go mad. So what? I shall dream. I shall dream that I am David, son of Sarah. I tell my mother what I have done with her tears and her prayers. I tell her what I have done with my years and my silences and my life. Why so late? I had no strength, mother. I could not accept your absence. If I have never written you, it is because I have never left you. You were the one who went away, and ever since I see you going away. I see nothing else. For years now, you have been leaving me, vanishing into the distance, swallowed by the black and silent tide. But the sky that drowned the fire cannot drown you. You are the fire. You are the sky. And this vision which haunts me, it is my offering to you. And the silence, it is on your lips, I find it and give it back. Wandering beggar or prisoner, it is always your voice I seek to set free inside me. And each time I address myself to strangers, I am speaking to you. So I contemplate the wall which bears my mother's face. She had two faces, my mother. One showed the daily sorrow of the Bocherike from Sunday to Friday. The other reflected the Shabbos the serenity of the Sabbath. 
and now this is the only one she has left, the sad face. A human trunk presses toward the wall, nestles against it, and I stand aside and look. In a flash I see from one end of the world to the other, and further, into my deepest self. I see all those who have stood there before me, bent with humility or touched with ecstasy, here before this very wall. Kings and prophets, warriors and priests, poets and philosophers, rich and poor. All those who throughout the ages have pleaded everywhere for a little compassion, a little kindness, it was here they came to speak of compassion and kindness. Here in this place, a sage of Israel once remarked, the stones are souls. It is they who each day they built an invisible temple. Still, it is not here that I will find my mother's soul. The soul of my mother found shelter in fire and not in stone. And to think that her own dream had been to come here and pray and meditate and cry, well, I shall dream in her place. But what about that old Hasid who comes running where I have seen where have I seen him before? Dressed in a black caftan and black felt hat, his prayer shawl under his arm, he hurls himself against the wall as if to smash his head. Hypnotized by the stones, he feels them, caresses them and sobs inwardly without shedding a tear. For a moment I observe him as if he were a stone among the stones. Then I see soldiers lifting him up, tossing him into the air, yelling, you, you must not weep, not anymore. The time for lamentations is over. We must rejoice, old man, we must cry our joy to the wall. It needs that joy and so do we. One circle is formed, then another, everyone is dancing. And on a carpet of shoulders, the old man is dancing too. He is not afraid of falling or flying away. He is not afraid of anything, and neither are we. Someone breaks into song, and that song fills the square, the city, and the whole country. Louder, louder, the old man shouts, bouncing back each time with new bigger, greater frenzy. He is in ecstasy, and so are we. Someone near me succumbs to tears. Someone is weeping, and it's not I. Someone is weeping, and it is I. I ought to be afraid, I know that. The miracle is too violent, the joy too intense, it cannot last forever. But I also know that I am dreaming. I am at the top of a mountain, I creep over a pebble, I fall. I see the abyss growing darker as it approaches, darker than the dark eye of the tempest. I am afraid, but fear itself is part of the dream. So my friends, it was a dream 40 years ago. But a year, the years go, and the dream remains. And all our prayers are that the dream, a dream of the Jewish people, and the humanity it, it incarnates, that dream should continue and it will. Thank you. All we can say is Amen for Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizal. I speak on behalf of my father, Bra Khaled Avua, with his great honor. And now we'll show a video, it's a short video, less than 10 minutes, which you'll see through visual, the story that we just heard, the prayer we just heard, the song that we just heard. So please.
Religion.